All right. Can we start with Shofar's little service? Yes, yes. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I guess Joseph is sick, and Joyce, hopefully they'll be here next Sabbath. Um, Chris, can you pray for him? Chris's father passed away on Tuesday. Had a massive fatal heart attack, so Chris is going through a hard time right now. Yeah. So let's pray for him. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my court case is next Friday. Really? That. You pray for that. Pray for victory. Amen. Next Friday? So not this, but next Friday? What date is that exactly? The first. The first. A week from yesterday. All right. We have election day. Voting is going on right now. Right now. And election day is March 5th. I'm the ballot over here, so we have to have change. So pray that we can defeat this. I feel good about it. I mean, it's a long shot, but we get. I, I do feel, no matter what happens, I think this uh, Ernest Bells has been exposed. And, it's over for him, but we need to have accountability. And, well, he's uh, putting out all this stuff about how 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 high how honest he is and how how he did did the Stark County Ridge and how he's a man of integrity and of representing us girls. You know the thing, the Lord. Sometimes the Lord says, "Stand back, and I will fight this battle for you." So all this negative publicity is coming out against him, and he's, uh, he's freaking out. And I'm not doing it. <laughs> you know, it's not. I couldn't afford to do it. Somebody and who? All these people that are putting all this, this exposing everything he's done. Uh, they're not. They're not promoting another candidate. At least not in these these mail outs. They're just showing. You know, you got to pick somebody besides this guy. So it's important. That I think the future of our country, the future of our county, hangs in the balance. And, yep, the state. and the future of our state, the future of our country, and therefore the world, because America is the last right. beacon of freedom. So let's let's be involved. What else is going on? Well, today... Uh, well, we were the last freak, beacon of freedom. I'm sorry. We're a police state living under a dictatorship with total, totalitarians, jailing their political enemies, uh, murdering people, threatening people, uh, corrupting the courts. They, 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 this is tyranny. Right. And, and we have no government. They've shredded the Constitution. All that's left is the Second Amendment. And when and the next, next government official comes up to you say, I'm sorry, you're, none of your orders are legal. I will not comply. We're under the Second Amendment because you shredded the rest of the Constitution. Get back in your car or, 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 yeah. or throw down. Look, look what's going on with Trump, all these bogus uh, accusations and court cases. It's awful. And, so, and, the, and they know that they know that we know that they know that they're lying. And, and this is all in your face. This is to break us. They're trying to break us. And it freaks them out that they haven't broken us yet. Well, they, they're breaking our country. They, they are they're in panic and fear because we were supposed to break by now. Instead, we are coming stronger. They're uh, frightened. All right, so um, Robert's been talking about this theme from the book of uh, the book of Enoch, judgment. All right. Amen. So hopefully that's what's uh, we need to have judgment. One of the two witnesses. And uh, we've, this is part of a series. I think uh, Robert's laid the foundation that the scripture tells the story of Enoch in the Old New Testament. It's referenced. And uh, so what is this book about? And one of the things, and, you know, that's what Yeshua talked about. He talked about judgment, right? When the Son of Man, that's another theme of the book of Enoch, comes with power and glory. And, he, and know, his return. Judges the nations. So... Uh, this is a, it's a biblical theme, Old New Testament, the day of the Lord, right? That's one of the last verses in the book of uh, the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. It's talking about the, the coming day of the Lord, the day of judgment. So I guess without further ado, let's have Robert come in and start. Uh, Robert C. Farrell. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, are we, um, is the camera tied on the uh, thing over here? We, last week, I think we were zoomed out. I'm going to make sure people can read. I'll try to write a little bigger here if I do any writing here. Right. Do we need to redo anything? No, 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 no. Well, I don't know. Except to Robert. Whatever he feels like he needs to share. It's his time. Okay. Well, we got you good. Well, so well, here's here's we something to. that... Okay. So a couple of things. Um, I was going to just pick up where we left, left off last time, and I probably will get right back to it as soon as I can. But I wanted to... Uh, to uh, since we were bringing up the topic of the end times and how troubling the times are and everything, I wanted to point out that this book is for these times, 
uh, and it addresses these times and it's kind of an instruction manual and a how-to on how to get through these times and what to expect and it lays it out pretty pretty plainly for us so for those of us who are here uh, I think just about everybody um, is up to speed so I don't have to do too much uh, in the way of um, you know introduction or rehashing or repeating so maybe we can make a little bit of progress today uh, I will say this just in, in way of summation for anybody out there uh, who might just be watching this video for the first time and not really quite understanding what this is about. Basically the contention goes like this. Number one, the Book of Enoch states that it is not for his time, but for the time of the removal of the wicked and the ungodly. So in other words, it's basically stating that it's going to be out of circulation for now and then reintroduced at some point. And it specifies exactly when that point is, as stated previously, the very first chapter of the book, it says, the words of the blessing of Enoch wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation. So the book of Enoch is for the day of tribulation. Okay, so it specifies that it is for our times. Uh, even if you go by biblical chronology, if you go by Usher's chronology, right, we are basically already in the millennium. So we're there. Um, and it says that it's, that it's going to be at a time when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed, right? Um, and he says, of course, that he he's took up his parable, again, so... You're going to be reading a lot of parabolic stuff in here. That Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, again, spiritual eyes, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, that is to say a spiritual vision, a heavenly vision, a vision, you know, of that which is above, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and, and, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. So it is for the elect, right, who are going to be present on the, um, the day of tribulation, right? So presumably the elect are those people who come, who are given this knowledge on the seventh day, that is to say on the day of tribulation. Okay, so... Okay, so insofar as Enoch says this, a person, a skeptic, an outsider, or even a Christian might say, so what, big deal. That's just a claim, right? So how do we back this up? And how do we make this, how do we enforce this, right? How do we make sure that this book makes it into the hands of the elect and it has its force at the end of time? Well, it just so happens that we have two books in our canonical New Testament named Jude, and the second letter of Peter. Right? And it just so happens that Jude makes a number of claims about the book of Enoch. And if you read through it, for example, you'll notice that in addition to making several allusions to other non canonical books, right? He makes an allusion in verse 9 to the assumption of Moses. Okay, so we know that he's painting outside of the lines here. He's reading things that, that, that people who read the canonical books don't read. Um, in verse 6, for example, he makes, allusion, he makes allusion to Enoch chapter, I believe it is 54, where he talks about that the angels are held under chains of darkness. Right? So that's an allusion. He talks about... Um, or they're hidden in their, under chains, I guess. They're, they're, uh, verse 13 talks about the mist of darkness, which is another allusion to the book of Enoch. So, you know, he's hit a couple of points before he hits on 14 and 15. He's clearly coloring outside of the lines and all that. So when he states in 14 and 15, he says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these men saying that the Lord cometh with ten thousands of the saints, etc. So 
what does he say? He cites the name of the source, Enoch, right? So he cites the book. So he's not he's not hiding it. Um, he cites the name of his source. Right? It's very straightforward, right? He cites the name of the source. He calls him the seventh from Adam, right? So that means it's it's old, right? He's giving it his antiquity, right? He says that he prophesied, right? Okay, so he prophesied, right? Which means he's a prophet, right? And then he says that, that he prophesied about these men who are what? There's certain men crept into the church unawares, right? So he's speaking to them, right? So it's relevant to his time. What well, relevant mean? It means it applies or it pertains to his time. It, it, it bears on his time. It, it's speaking about that time. It's, it means that it's that it's important mm -hmm. and it uh, it speaks it, to it the men of his age. It fits and it's timely. Yeah, and um, so that okay. So you have all of these things that are supporting the fact that that what the Jews had as a canon, for example, was not what was taught by the apostles. Um, then he gives the quote, Behold the Lord cometh. Okay. And it goes on for quite some time. Behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and convince all the ungodly. Of all. So it's an exact quote. And it has to do with the power and the coming of the Lord, right? Behold the Lord cometh, right? With ten thousands of saints to do what? To execute judgment upon all. So that's the power, right? He does say that this is something that the apostles taught. So you have it in the Bible that the apostles taught the book of Enoch, right? That they taught the antiquity of this book, that they regarded it as prophetic, that it regarded it as pertaining to his time and also the time of the coming of the Lord. So you have that straight from the canonical books. So now you have something to take to the churches. You have something to take to the Christians. And indeed, even to the atheists and the people outside of the church, because this works on both levels. It just is an objective fact that he makes these statements, and that appears to be his assertion, right? So here's an interesting thing. He says, first of all, in his book, that you have to fight for the faith, right? You have to fight for it, the faith, okay? So and in the process of that, he's quoting all these books that are outside of the Bible, and he's giving them antiquity, he's giving them their prophethood, he's giving them their relevance, and all that. So what apparently happened was, these are basically answers to questions that people had. People have the question of whether it was proper to use this book, right? So presumably they had questions as to the source, right? People, he answers a question about its antiquity, so why would he answer a question that wasn't a question? I guess is the simple thing, right? So was Enoch of old, right? Was he, was he an ancient prophet, right? Apparently, according to Jude, he was, right? Did people regard Enoch as a prophet, right? Apparently, Jude is saying that he did. So he's answering that question. Is Enoch a prophet? Yes, he prophesied, right? Is he ancient? Yes, he's old. He's a seventh from Adam. Is this book really authentic? Yes, I'm not afraid to cite the name of the book, right? Um, is it relevant to our time? Is it something that was purely limited to the time of the antediluvian times, right? Did this book stop being relevant when the flood came, right? Apparently, he answers that question by referring to these men who were crept into the church unawares, who were attacking the faith, right, that was once for all entrusted to the saints. What might that faith, faith be? Could it be that they were teaching outside of the the canon that the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, you know, adhere to, right? We know that there was not very little love lost between Yeshua and the scribes and the Pharisees. He has very nasty things to say about them from time to time, if you'll notice, 
right? So it's not some great shakes to think that he might disagree with their canon, he might disagree with their theology, and a lot of the stuff that he's throwing at them, he's throwing at them from their canon because they accept at least that much, and therefore can be held accountable for at least that much. Mm -hmm. But Judas coming, but Judas painting outside the line. So then, I guess the the question might be. Is this then an apostolic teaching? Because Jude asserts that the apostles taught this, right? So that would explain why Peter, perhaps, um, get that. This is just this is just stuff that you have to understand is there, and why is it there? Is it there for no reason, or is it there for our benefit at the end of time? Is it something for us to pull out like a sword, so to speak, as a weapon against the falsehoods that have been taught to us, against the traditions that have been taught to us, against the paradigm that has been given to us, right? Well, apparently Jude was brought to Peter, right? People had questions about the book of Jude right then, apparently, because the book was then brought to Peter, who was an apostle, right? Right? Is this, is this something that the apostles taught? You can easily you know, uh, imagine them asking Peter, right? So Peter actually makes uh, a couple of statements. First of all, he takes the book of Jude and he sort of writes around it and he makes commentary on it. Almost all of Jude, almost all of it is in Second Peter. It's as if somebody said, hey, you know, is this thing right? You know, he's saying you apostles taught this, right? You know, and then he takes the book and he writes around it. He literally writes around it. So a person can, could say, look, first of all, number one, the Bible says, look, if you're not faithful in little things, right? How is it that you could be faithful in big things, right? Big, you know, how will you be trusted with the big things, right? As if to say, if you consider it a trifle, if you consider it something that you can sweep under the rug or ignore, you know, before God, ignore that he says that he's ancient, ignore that he says that he's prophetic, you feel that it's safe to ignore that, it, that it's something that can be safely dismissed and not spoken of at the end time when it very specifically says it's for the end times, right? Then maybe you got another thing coming, right? Then maybe there should be some correction if that's the case, right? And so you should expect to see some kind of mechanism in existence for legitimizing what the Book of Enoch is saying in order for it to be in effect at the time. And what I'm saying is that 2 Peter and Jude provide that mechanism in the New Testament um, in order to justify the reintroduction of this book, that this is the entrance, if you will, uh, into reading this book and understanding this book, and it's the actual template for which you can understand the entire New Testament. Because if you read the book of Enoch, you read about the Son of Man, right? You read a lot of similar phraseology, for example, the meek shall inherit the earth, you know, the elect shall inherit the earth, right? Um, you know, it, uh, there are many mansions, right? That's what the book of Enoch says. That's also what the Gospels tell us, right? Could it be then, if this was a genuine apostolic teaching, right? Again, Peter, an apostle, Jude, a brother, brother also of James, for that matter, right? If this is an apostolic teaching and it has been lost and it has been obscured, right, then it's for a reason. It's so that, it's so that this book will not be in circulation until the day of tribulation, at which point it will be in circulation and that these two provide that mechanism, right? So that being said, one of the things that Peter talks about is the world of old, right? He says the world of old. The world of old was destroyed, right? Was destroyed by deluge, right? Um, and then he, he mentions that a couple of times in his book. And then he also says... Who oh, deluge. Huh? Deluge. Yeah, the deluge, deluge the, flood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the flood. Yeah, the flood. The flood. The flood. The flood. Um, so he talks about the world of old, right? And then he says prophets of old. So let's just mark that as it's meaning antediluvian or, or pre-flood. Um, and I'll just put under here pre-flood. Because that's what that means. Anti means before and deluge means flood, right? So the, pro the world of old 
was the pre-flood world. So when he says that prophets, that prophets of old, right? Remember old equals, you know, pre-flood, right? So when he says that prophets of old, he means pre-flood prophets, right? That they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, the very fact that, um, I'm sorry, the very fact that he's saying that, that the world of old represents the antediluvian world, and that the prophets of old represents the pre-flood prophets as well. So, one thing, we, and that, that the pre-flood prophets, again, were, were spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, is Enoch a pre-flood prophet, according to Peter, right? And is, if so, then is he saying that, that he's inspired by the Holy Spirit? That appears to be the case. That appears to be what he's asserting. So not only does Jude call him a prophet, but Peter takes it further and said that he was a prophet from the antediluvian times who spake as he was moved by the Holy, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, right? So Peter makes this claim. So now you have Jude making an assertion that it's an apostolic claim, and then you have Peter who is an apostle backing him up and also making that claim. So as you read all, all this stuff about how evil these people are, how, how terrible they are, they're, 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 they're clouds without water, they're, you know, they're dogs who return to their own vomit and things like that, right? You know, he's, he's speaking very specifically about the people who infiltrated the church, right? In order to subvert the mystery of the scriptures that would come to be rejected um, and to make it possible for us to remember those things. Remember he talks about, I want you to recall the words that were spoken in the past by the holy prophets, right? Through the apostles, right? And then Peter says, through us the apostles, right? So he's seconding it, right? So Jude says this is apostolic and Peter says it's apostolic. So how many witnesses do we gotta have? Two or three, right? We got at least two, right? And three if you count Enoch, right? Because it says that of itself, right? But th that's a pretty heavy, that's a pretty heavy statement to say because here's something that people reject. They say it's not old. They say it's not prophetic. They say it's, you know, basically uh, a cobbled together, you know, kind of gobbledygook is what they say. They call it a false writing. So when Peter says, for example, that we did not follow cunningly concocted fables when we told you about the power and the coming, right? Remember what is Enoch 1.9? Uh, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of the saints to execute judgment. So people were saying that, that, that when he told you about the power and coming, he's talking about when Jude told you that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied to these men, saying, Behold, he cometh with 10,000 of the saints. He's saying that when, yeah. when, we, when, we, when we told you about that, in other words, he was with us, right? Why is he saying this? You know, he's clearly saying this because this was in doubt. He's saying this is in question, and also something for us to recall. The, the very book starts out by saying, I, I, for those of you that have come to a like faith as us, in other words, you have come to understand what was taught at the beginning. Remember when Yeshua says in, in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, why do you seek for the end? Have you found the beginning? Because where the beginning is, there's, there's the end. It's going to be right there. In other words, it's encoded to be decoded. So when you decode it, it's the same as the encoding. The end is the beginning because it's a matter of, of laying it down and, and picking it back up, right? It's about understanding it after a long hiatus or a long, you know, missing. So with that as our background, that, that's just constantly going to be the message. We talked about how we were maybe living in the end times. And I want to kind of pick up where we started out, but for just as a parenthetical, I wanted to get a little ahead of myself because this... This section that we're reading, uh, all the, well, maybe not all of the Judgment Day prophecies, but a good chunk of them, enough for you to understand what's going on. Um, Where are you going to 105 again, or? Well, I'm going to jump to 92, chapter 92, which in this case I jump from 51, I believe, to 92 because I jump from the parable section all the way to the Epistle of Enoch. Okay. But for those of you who don't have a book, do you have a book? You want a book? I've got plenty. If you want one. Okay, so anyways, so just look at 92, look at what he says, 
Okay, the book written by Enoch, right? Indeed, Enoch wrote this complete doctrine of wisdom, which is praised by all men and a judge of all the earth. Now, the groundwork that we just laid, right, is basically that groundwork. Because if you have the apostles themselves affirming this book, does that not give you the authority to go to the church and say, hey, you know, for all your power and for all your authority and for everything you've said and for everything you've done, does this not trump everything you've done? Does this not undo everything you've taught? Does this not remove the foundation upon which your entire teachings are built? It does not the whole thing come crashing down in the light of this knowledge? Did you not withhold this information from us? Right? Did you not take and destroy this book? Right? Did you not take and destroy this knowledge? You know what I'm saying? And for those of the people who didn't have a hand in this, it's like, hey, listen, don't you understand that this this is this is a work and a wonder? Because God is showing his power through this, his power to take back what men have have, have stolen. Have hidden. Yeah. Yes. And to restore that which was destroyed. Right? Is this not a work and a wonder? Because it literally is that. Right? If this is what it says it is. So what does he say? He says, listen. The, the, okay, the book written by Enoch, and D, Enoch indeed wrote this complete doctrine of wisdom, which is praised by all men and a judge of all the earth. For all my children who shall, who dwell, shall dwell on the earth, and for the future generations who shall observe huh? uprightness and peace. Right? Again, once for all delivered unto the saints. It was for the whole world. Right? Um... For those, for the children who dwell on the earth, and for the the future generations who shall observe of uprightness and peace, um, let not your spirit be troubled on account of the times, for the holy and great one has appointed days for all things, um, and the righteous one shall arise from sleep, shall arise and walk in the paths of righteousness, and all his paths and conversation shall be in eternal goodness and grace. He will be gracious to the righteous and give them eternal upright, uprightness and he will give them power so that they shall be endowed with goodness and righteousness and he shall walk in eternal light and sin shall perish in darkness forever and, and shall no more be seen from that day and forevermore hmm. right so this is the promise of the uh, the age if you will that that we will be that we will be given the truth and we will walk in eternal uprightness. And I know um, if Joseph was there, he'd be like, oh yeah, because it, it rings familiar to me. It sounds familiar to me from some scripture in the Bible. Like all of the things that Enoch wrote, bits and pieces of it seems to be thrown into the Bible. There's a, there's a subjective element and there's an objective element to all of this. And this is, a, this is important to understand. What, what subjective means What subjective means is that that I believe it because it seems right to me in my mind this this seems right in my thinking this seems right the problem with subjective thinking is that um, let's say you're a Muslim you know and it just seems right to you right I just I just feel like it's right you know uh, a lot of times, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular, but, you know, like Mormons, for example, you know, again, what do they say? They say, well, I, I felt this burning in my heart. You know what I'm saying? That's kind yeah. of their thing, right? You know, I feel it because they feel it, right? So it kind of has to do with thinking and feeling. We can't rely on that. Okay. Yeah, it could be anything, right? You but what I, you. but then there's a, there, okay. Because, because these people have made truth subject to their thinking, right, mm -hmm. and to their feelings, yeah. right? Yeah. I want this because I want it. It's right because it, it, it works for me, right? right? right. Uh, you know, uh, I was raised that way, right? So, you know, I just accept it. Mormons actually do that. In there, when they try to spread their faith, it's just, just how does it feel? Follow your feelings. <laughs> Gosh, right, yeah. right. I've heard them say that. But Muslims, that's just, you know, that's all they know. Yeah. You know? And they're, it's an imperialistic religion. They want to destroy everybody else. And, and they seize on a difficult doctrine like the, the Trinity. Oh, the Trinity's hard to explain. 
But then they have their own bizarre beliefs, like, oh, Jesus wasn't really crucified, it was an illusion, stuff like that. There, there's a lot of mental gymnastics that goes into <laughs> yeah. a lot of this stuff. Right. Yeah. And um, what, I, what I was trying to point out is that there's a, that the, the whole thing that I've been talking about is a little bit more on the object. Objective, yeah. All right. That means it's based on evidence. It's yeah, based on what's there. Look for evidence. Right? Look for proof. So here's the thing. Um, a person might think that the Bible is hooey. A person might think that. I mean, I was once an atheist, and I thought, why waste your life, you know, chasing a dream? You know, uh, you know, God wanted to show Himself. Why didn't just show Himself? You know, but this is how He's showing Himself. Okay. This is, you know, come to realize. But it is a you know, the, the, you can accept or reject with the, it, it, whether you agree with the Bible or not, you can accept it or reject it. I mean, that's right. fine. There's so you know, many I mean, these people, yeah. they obviously reject it, right? Yeah. These people, you know, they, they, they have little asterisks there, you know what I'm saying? There's other, there's other, I mean, it's not just them. I hate to, I hate to pick on any one person because I let everybody else off in the process. Right, right. But, uh, the idea is that, okay, the objective, it is objectively true that he cites the name of the source, right? It's objectively true. Whether you accept it, I mean, a person might say, well, dude is, you know, bunk or whatever, but it doesn't matter because it, that's what we have and it is there. So starting with that assumption, right? He cites the name of the source, he gives him his antiquity, of course, right, et cetera, all this stuff. You, you just go down and you just check the list, right? The usual stuff. He's saying all of this stuff. That is his assertion, right? Peter does write around this book. You know what I'm saying? He takes it and he makes commentary on it. What does he add to it? What does he say about it, right? That did happen. So it's it's a little bit more in the way of, of objectivity rather than subjectivity, right? Which gives it a certain power. Because if it's objective, then it is for believer and non-believer alike. I'm sorry, you were going to say something? That's why uh, we're all, all humans are that way. Some are worse than others, but we all, uh, at times, uh, if we really want something, we try to change it, the, the word, to give what we want. At some point in time in our lives, to, you know, to maneuver the word to, to make it sound the way we want it to mm -hmm. give what we want because we're human and that's human right. nature right. and that's why he says uh, that even our best is right. uh, filthy, yeah. filthy rags that's why we're saved by grace because there's no other way that we can get into heaven right. so um, you know we're all guilty of that mm -hmm. you know and, and, and some are kind of worse than and James kind of speaks to that a little bit. He says, you know, you ask and you receive not because you ask in vain. You want to spend it on your own lusts and your own desires and stuff like that. So you're subjecting it to yourself, in which case you won't receive. Or if you do receive, it's not going to be good. Um, let me see. Um, so, okay, so what we kind of left off last week, just getting back to that, but just to lay the groundwork, that this is, this is something that is for the believer and the non-believer. And this is kind of what makes it judgment. Because, because if, if the secular don't have a way out, and the religious establishment doesn't have a way out, if they're backed into a corner to where they actually have to lie against the truth and they, they sort of expose themselves, right, to anybody who's seeking truth, They'll know they're lying. They're, they'll know they're so they're they're being exposed, right? Now this isn't to say that that this is all anger and vitriol and you know you see there's there it, you see a balance in the Book of Enoch. There is the contrast between the sinners and the ungodly uh, against the righteous and the elect, and it's the self same thing that that does the uh, the the sinner in as it, uh, as um, blesses the elect. In other words, the word, the manifestation of the true meaning of the word of God on that day, the full understanding that we are to be given. In other words, the day dawns in our hearts, the morning star rises in our hearts. In other words, Peter gives us a timetable, right? He tells us when this will happen, right? So, I mean, and so with that in mind, you know, the idea is that, that, that the people who built the society on a lie and people who built the theology on a lie are undermined. So the entire edifice falls. 
the entire the entirety of everything falls upon this. And you'll see this driven home again and again and again and again and again in the book of Enoch. And we'll go over it, you know, Lord willing, uh, you know, as we go. But it is the same phenomenon. The revelation of the truth is light to the righteous, and it is destruction to the unrighteous. It undoes everything they've done, they do. So in other words, what he's done is he's allowed them to build their house on the sand, right? And then when the winds, like the wind of doctrine, right? The rains, the water from above, the word from above, comes and hits them, their foundation is shaken, right? And so this, the, the foundation that the apostles laid, again, Jude and Peter among them, but I mean, this isn't just about them, but I'm just, I'm focusing, kind of hyper-focusing on those two because the that is, well, it, they're, they're, it, they're kind of synoptic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, you see that, that Mark and Matthew and Luke are often called the synoptic gospels because they, they appear to go over the oh, same things yes. and they appear to use the same sources or whatever in their phraseology and their verbiage and whatever, the ordering and all that, are mostly similar, mm -hmm. right? Um, John's kind of off on its own, but it still is a narrative gospel. It still has some commonalities, but they, they call them synoptic. Well, I mean, it, to, to have two gospels that are interrelated, like Second Peter and Jude, is an interesting phenomenon to exist. And oftentimes with commentaries and things like that, you'll see the two books put together, but not necessarily exposited in this manner, right? Which is surprising because, you know, uh, this is obvious stuff. And it's meant to be obvious, too. That's the funny thing because when you think about how the way in which, um, you know, the, the invite went out to all the different people to go to the, the, the feast, the wedding feast of the sun, right, for the king, the king invited everybody and everybody had better things to do. And at some point, he's like, you know what? Just go out to the end of the streets. Just get anybody and everybody. You know what? Because those people who I invited, they didn't want to come, right? And help them feast on the word. Let them feast on the truth. Let them feast on that which was, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if, if it seems a bit like he's showing them up, if he's a, you know, if he's a sense saying, listen, I'll take anybody and everybody over you, right? If it's kind of an insult, well... Kind of like so be it. It's kind of an insult. Gentiles, it's like <laughs> if it's if it's a kind of an act of spite, it's kind of an act of spite. But it's also an act of mercy, because all those people got to eat, right? You know, and they 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 got to eat from the. You know what I'm saying? So it's for those people who are out there on that day, right? Who have been denied this food, who've been denied this, that they finally get their invitation and they go. Um, how much time do I have? Um, Okay, well, let me just kind of read through this real quick because it's kind of a big paragraph. I want to at least get through chapter 11, so let me go through this one page. So chapters 10 and 11 here. Um, and then I jump over to the parables because I, I wanted to treat the Book of the Watchers and also the journeys and stuff as a separate issue, um, transitioning from, you know, Judgment Day to those things. But this kind of touches a little bit upon the Watchers. Um, but it also touches on judgment, so I figured I'd leave it in because, you know, I wasn't going to break it apart. It says, Then said the Most High, the Holy Great One spake, and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech, and said, Go to him, uh, go to Noah, and tell him in my name, hide thyself, and reveal to him the end that is approaching. Wait, where are you? Uh, 10 and 11. Oh. It's like the second, there's like third page in, fourth page in, something like that. Um, and he says, uh, hide thyself and reveal to him the end that is approaching and that the whole earth will be destroyed and that the deluge is about to come upon the whole earth and he will destroy all that is on it. And now instruct him that he may escape and his seed may be preserved for all generations of the world. Um, and again, we had Adam and Eve, of course. And of course, we had Cain and Abel, right? So it's a Presumably supposed to have come through Abel, right? But we all know what happened to Abel, right? Mm. So we had to have Seth, right? Right? And then so when when the flood was going to come, right? If we hadn't preserved a human being such as Noah. And if you, you can read about Noah had a miraculous birth, that's also in the... Um, the book of Enoch, which, well, I'm not going to go over in this particular thing, but you, you, if you read in it, uh, I think it's 108 or, I don't know, something like that. It's very towards the end of the book. 
he, it's like it's like he had uh, he was white as light and as red as a rose, and he was born that way, and they thought that he was born of the angels and all that other stuff, right? So that would have been destroyed had the flood not preserved Noah, but of course that wasn't the case. You know, he did go through Seth's line, and so we are all descended from Seth, you know, apparently. Uh, but, you know, if, if he had not saved Noah, Noah, then there would have been nobody from that. You know, it would have been a complete waste. No, nothing would have been preserved, in other words, right? Um, and then we talked about last week, too, how presumably that being the case, that you have Noah and uh, um, Noah preserving not just all of the animals and, and whatnot, but presumably also the books from antediluvian times, right? This seems to be what... I mean, if not in actual written form, but I think it was in written form because it says over and over again that he was a scribe, that he wrote these things down. Right. So it wasn't just recollections or whatever. I think the whole tape, the whole case is supposed to be airtight. Um, and it says, now instruct him that, that uh, he may escape and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. So by means of Noah, the line of Seth is preserved. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and um, again, hand and foot, they're symbolic terms. Um, you know, it sort of equals your deeds. And your foot sort of equals your path, right? Um, in parabolic terms, right? Generally speaking. Um, so when you say, uh, for example, in the Gospel of Thomas, when you replace a hand with a hand and a foot with a foot and an image with an image and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? He's talking about, um, you know, uh, instead of seeing with, say, earthly eyes, you're seeing with heavenly eyes. Instead of hearing with earthly ears, you hear with heavenly ears. Instead of thinking with an earthly mind, you think with a heavenly mind, right? Uh, instead of seeing things on the literal, you th see things on the spiritual. And so you have, you know, two, you know, things that you see. When your deeds are done, uh, how should I say, poorly right? In other words, the works of your hands aren't revealing the truth, right? So you're replacing a hand of falsehood with a hand of truth. When your path is not right, you're, you're replacing the wrong path with the right path. You know what I'm saying? That's what Thomas is getting at. And he's saying that his hands and his feet, in other words, his path and his deeds are kind of set in stone. They're bound, right? He has to follow a certain path at this point. He has, he has a certain course of action, right, that he's limited to from this point forward. So, in other words, his movement and his actions are restricted by the curse. In other words, that the knowledge that there that the higher is couched in the lower sort of forces him to push the lower as so as to obscure the higher, right? So in other words, everything from that point forward that the deeds are going to be off and the path is going to be off at that point, he's bound by this curse. Um, and it cast him into darkness. In other words, um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, he's going to be bound in that kingdom of darkness where he's not able to look upon the light or to see it or to proclaim it, but only darkness and to proclaim that only, and that he's limited by that, and that he is in the de desert, which is in Dudale. The desert is symbolic, too. Um, desert or wilderness, wilderness sometimes. Well, Desert is a waterless place. Right, doesn't he say like dry? Yeah, right? dry place. Okay. Yeah, dry place, waterless place. That has to do with the secular, right? That has to do with places where God is not, right? So, in other words, it has to do with unbelief or whatever. So, I mean, it has those connotations to it. Wilderness is kind of like a place of waiting. You know, like you see the woman was taken to the wilderness. The Israelites were out in the wilderness. Um, you know, John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, the higher language, in other words, it applies to the wilderness of this age, sort of metaphorically speaking. Um, you know, that kind of thing, if you want to see it. Dudael. Um, Where is, what is Dudael? Well, okay, so Dudael, the way I understand it, um, and I wish Joseph were here because he could probably correct me, but my, my understanding is that this has to do with the... Um, the kettle, or the um, uh, um, 
or like a crucible. Okay, right? I see what you're saying. So it has to do with his own sort of pain and suffering, or that's at least what's connoted by the word. I believe that he sort of, you know, kept it's limited a and place. kind of a yeah. boiling, you know, nice little warm spot for him, you know, there. And uh, place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness. And I guess the idea is that he's being held down and it's painful for him and he's suffering and whatnot. Um, and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light, right? So he knows that he's doomed and there's no hope for him. On the day of the great judgment, he will be cast into the fire. Book of Revelation talks about that. Of course, that's the second death, which is being cast into the lake of fire. So all of his works and everything that he does with his feet and his hands, for example, you know, using that darkness, according to that darkness, in this wilderness of this age or whatever, he's speaking of it metaphorically, right? If that's, the, if that's the way to look at it, that's what that would sort of mean, that up until that day he's going to be destroyed. Because, like any, because a lot of this is just an illusion. Like if you see what I was just now talking about, everything that human beings will talk, tell you Everything that has been taught up to now seems ridiculous, right? It seems off the mark. It seems wrong. It seems like an illusion. It's like any other illusion that you look through and you see through. If you're able to see through an illusion, it's very difficult uh, to fall into that illusion again because you already, you, you've already seen it. It's hard to be fooled by the same illusion twice, although some optical illusions will get you every time. You know what I'm saying? But it's the idea is that if you see through an illusion, right, then it's destroyed. Armageddon, it's burnt up. It's gone twisted. forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so seeing through the lie, um, it's sort of their destruction because now they don't have any power. Their power depended on their lies and the power depends on their wealth and their, their institutions and then the kinds of things that they've set up in an earthly fashion throughout the age. Right. And if all of that is undermined, right, then they're basically done with. They're, there's no place for them. Um, and it says, and on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague and all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things, which the washer watchers have disclosed and taught, taught their sons and the whole earth shall be corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him ascribe all sin. And you see a, a nod to this. What is it in Leviticus where the 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 goat is sent out into the desert um, with the sins of Israel and um, oh, yeah. his name is Azazel right it's, well it says for Azazel so the desert um, again uh, is this uh, doctor is this the Leviticus where he talks about this the the Azazel is sent out into the uh, desert I'm pretty sure that's where it yeah. is um, so again we have desert in Leviticus right and we have the mm -hmm. desert here in Enoch, right? So we have Azazel. Uh, you have Azazel mentioned there. You have a scribe all sin to Azazel, right? The sins of the Israelites are attached here, right? So you know what I'm saying. You see the you see the similarity here. Right. Leviticus 16, 8 through 10. Okay, but you see what I'm saying? So what are the common elements? Desert, Azazel, sin, is there anything else that's that's common here? But you see the you see the, the nature here. So the Old Testament gives a, a, a nod to the book of Enoch as well. It's, it seems not, to affirm it. We could read it real quick. It's not a big section. You, you want to read it? I don't okay, have yeah, it. Yeah. It says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself to make atonement for himself and his house. So this is the Day of Atonement, right? Mm -hmm. Yom Kippur in the fall. So he offers it. Before Aaron can offer sacrifice to the people, he has to atone for his own sins. So sacrifice is a bull. Then he shall take two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the, uh, the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one for Yahweh and the other for Azazel in the Hebrew. We translate that as scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on the which on which the Lord's or Yahweh's lot fell, and offered as a sin offering. So it's two goats. One is sacrifice, right? And his blood is put in the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. But the goat on which fell to the scapegoat, or to the Zazel, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, and it shall be as a scapegoat in the wilderness. So what they did, 
is you take these two goats. One, you lay your hands on it, you, you'd impute the sins of the nation on the goat, and you sacrifice the goat, and its blood would be poured in the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. They'd impute the sins of the people on the other goat, too. That would be taken to the wilderness and released for Azazel, as it says. That's the scapegoat. Yeah. So, so, but, I mean, they, clearly there's parallels here. So this isn't just Jude. I mean, this is Moses, right? But this is the kind of argument that he's given us. Because then you can go to the Jews and tell them the same thing. So you have something for the Christians and something for the Jews. And not only that, for anybody who's interested, just as a parenthetical, right? Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is actually identical to, uh, to Enoch 6, 1 through 4. They're actually identical. So that's another touchstone right there, right? Um you know, so in other words, it's it's all the way from Moses. You know, uh, it's not just Second Peter and Jude. It's all the way from the beginning, right? It exists in the Torah, which is, I mean, the least common denominator. I mean, even the Syrians and the Samaritans or whatever that they read the Torah. So it's for them too. So the idea is that that we do have these uh, points of contact. Um, and it says again um, that through the works that were that were taught by Azazel to him ascribe wool sin. And again, we see him as a scapegoat. And to Gabriel said the Lord, proceed against the bastards and the reprobates, and against the children of fornication, to destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers from amongst men, and cause them to go forth. Send them one against the other, that they may destroy one another in battle. For length of day shall they not have, and request that, that they, their fathers, make of these shall not be granted to their fathers on their behalf, for they hope to live an eternal life, and that each one of them will live 500 years. Um, okay, so the idea is that they're going to go and battle against each other. You know, we've seen that wars throughout history, and, you know, they kind of exist, you know, on other levels too. I mean, there's political battles, there's, you know, spiritual battles. There's economic battles, you know, companies battle each other out. I mean, there it's just one against the other. It's this constant striving against one another that society is essentially built on. It's sort of a weird sort of irony that all the stability that we have is through war and through force and through violence and, you know, through deception and all those kinds of things that people do to war against one another. It's not a pretty sight, but that's the fate of the world until the day of judgment. Right at which point the wicked and the godless sort of be removed, and that from that point going forward, as we'll get to here in a minute, um, it's going to be different. Um, and it says, and then the Lord said to Michael, Go and bind some Jaza and his associates who have united themselves with the women, so have defiled, to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth. So the day of their judgment and of their consummation. So number one, however long 70 generations is. Oh, the generation is what, like 100 years? Well, if you think about it in terms of 7,000 years, right? right? If you think about it in terms of 7,000 years, right? Yeah. Then, what's, then what's that divided by, you know, 70, whatever, right? It's so that's not, one, 100. Yeah, it's not a consistent, talk about a generation. Sometimes it's 100 years, sometimes it's 40 years. So it's not a consistent. Mm. But it does but conform to the numbers, seven. If, yeah. if you consider it to be 100, um, if you consider that to be the measure, um, then kind that's of, kind of what the, 70 eternal, generations like might be. It, it kind of falls in line with his whole timeline. When you... Yeah, that's that what I'm saying. It, it all just sort of conforms to yeah. it anyway. Um, and it says, okay, but the, okay, so bind them fast for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth. Okay, so remember, like in Revelation, you talk about people who dwell on the earth and people, you know, the vine of the earth as opposed to Yeshua, which is the true vine, right? You know, there's the true vine is contrasted with the vine of the earth, so the true vine is the vine of heaven. You see what I'm saying? You could just yeah. sort of fill in the blanks there, right? So the earth has to do with earthliness, or earthly teachings, earthly level, etc. So you could just sort of, usually you could just sort of parenthetically put the L-Y after it. Those who dwell on the earth are basically earth-minded earth, earth -minded people, thinking about the earth or whatever. And the valleys of the earth, remember what does John the Baptist say? The valleys will be filled in, the mountains right. will be made low, mm -hmm. right? So 
It's like you have valleys, right? For example, like say here's your valley. And the earth will be flat. <laughs> well, but it's metaphoric because right. look, the people of look, these are like the low people, right? These yeah. are the, like the nothings Weather. and the nobodies, right? <laughs> this is the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, it denotes a low point. Right. They're gonna right. and remember like when Satan would, would uh, the serpent had his like apparently he must have had legs or something, right? Because at this point he was cursed and he had to crawl along, you know, the earth. Right, can't draw a snake, but okay, that's your that's snake. That's fine. Right, <laughs> we get it. If uh, if if you know you got your rocks over here or something like that, you could kind of see how what he's doing is yeah, he's doomed valleys. to conform to the earth. Yeah, he's yeah. he's doomed to conform, right? And the idea is that um, that the earth is something that is inherently unequal. You know, it, I mean, look, I mean, not everybody can't be rich. Like, if, if everybody were rich, I mean, can you imagine, you know, you have a butler, but your butler's rich too. What, does your butler have a butler? Does his butler have a butler? You know what I'm saying? Right. You just can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that in capitalism. You can't, you can't do that. Everybody can't be rich, right? right. Which I'm not advocating for another system. I'm just saying it's a worldly system like any other worldly system. And my, you know, with op equal opportunity and blah, 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 blah. It might it be, be fairer better. or better, tell but your, it's not perfect. Tell right? your butler, I'll, I'll, um, I, I want you to bring me tea. Well, wait, I'll pay my butler to bring tea. <laughs> no, wait, I'll pay my butler. See how that doesn't work. Okay, so anyway. So anyway, but like the mountains would be like your high places, right? <laughs> so when John the Baptist is saying, look, you know, the high mountains will be made low, right? And the low places will be made high, right? That's essentially making your way straight, right? Or the idea is that you're 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 leveling everything out because that world will be destroyed. Though the kings of the earth will be humbled, the humbled people of the earth will be raised up. But he's conformed to the valleys of the earth because, in the same way that that the serpent was was forced to go on his belly and conform to the earth, these people have to pander to what is lowest and base mm. in man. See what I'm saying? Uh, everything out there is basically driven by your bodily needs. I mean, you got a roof over your head, right? right. You got to pay for it, right? You want food in your mouth, you got to you got to buy it, or you got to grow it, or something, right? right. You, you have to put something into it, right? So you're kind of you're kind of limited by your body, right? right? And so society as a whole, the way that they push things on you, is they use all kinds of things that appeal to the flesh, right. your desires, your wants. Mm -hmm your insecurities or whatever, they all have to do with your flesh and your fleshly thinking. So he's sort of bound to the valleys of the earth, so to speak, in that regard. Um, till the day of their judgment and consummation. Again, um, the, and the, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated, which is what kind of this is. It, it's because the, the word is there eternally as a light shining in a dark place, for example, right? It is there eternally. Um, um, and it says, um, and their judgment is that is forever and ever is consummated. In those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire, again, the lake of fire, and to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. And whosoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from thenceforth be bound together with them until the end of all generations. So they're going to share their fate. And destroy all the spirits of the reprobate and the children of the watchers because they have wronged mankind. Destroy all wrong from the face of the earth, and let every evil work come to an end, and let the plant of righteousness and truth appear, and it shall prove a blessing. Um, the works of righteousness and truth shall be planted in truth and joy forevermore. Sounds okay, like and this is and <laughs> yes, this and then okay, but this is, I mean, but, I mean that pertained to their time, but also metaphorically yeah. to our time. So it's, mm -hmm. again, it's operating on two levels. And then it says, and then shall the righteous escape, and they shall live and, and shall beget thousands of children. And all the days of their youth and their old age, they shall complete in peace. And it says, and then the whole turf, earth will be tilled in righteousness, and all shall be planted with trees and be full of blessing. And all desirable trees shall be planted on it, and they shall plant vines on it. And the vines that they plant shall yield wine in abundance. And as for all the seed which is sown, Thereon each measure of it shall bear a thousand, and each measure of olive shall yield tw um, twenty. I'm sorry, ten presses of oil. 
and cleanse out the earth from all oppression and from all unrighteousness and from all sin and from all godlessness and all uncleanness that is wrought upon the earth and destroy from off the earth and all the children of men shall become righteous and the nation shall offer adoration and praise me and shall all worship me and the earth shall be cleansed from all defilement and from all sin and from all punishment and from all torment and I will never again send them upon it from generation to generation forever. Amen. Right? So in other words, um, the idea is that this is the finality of that world. And so like I was saying before, if they built their entire kingdoms on lies and those lies get exposed, then that, that destroys the entire edifice of lies and destroys them entirely. And apparently that is their fate. From that point on, everybody sees through the illusion right as revelation says nobody buys their merchandise anymore right it's all over and done with and then it says at that point in those days will i open the store chambers of blessings which are in the heavens and send them down upon the earth over the work and labor of the children of men and truth and peace shall be associated throughout all the days of the world and throughout all the generations of men so this being the case this is kind of where we're at yes. so in other words once the truth comes out once knowledge is increased in other words it talks about this right um how our people perish from lack of knowledge if once once that knowledge is restored then we will flourish you know right. for the well i, but I don't think i'll knowledge. be around for that <laughs> i'd love to be but i don't know if i'll be around for that <laughs> All right, let's close the word of prayer and transition to worship service. Oh, Father, we thank you for the blessings you've given to us. Thank you for your word. Help us to listen to what you've said in ages past. And obey your word. Apply your truths to our lives. And help us also to share your word with others. And uh, work through us as we transform this world and, and uh, advance the kingdom of God. And help us be transformed in the image of your dear Son, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.